All right, we're live. I'm here with uh, one of my best friends in the world and probably the smartest man I know. Um, who's also drinking a monster. I love it. <laughs> and also, just a side note, um, we do have a cupcake on the table. It was his birthday last Sunday, and I told him that I was going to do something special for him. And I guess we get to do this interview, and I get to learn a lot, and we get to feast on a cupcake afterwards. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> so how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm <laughs> doing excellent. How's your uh, quarantine been so far? It's been uh, a roller coaster to an extent. <laughs> That's dealing with classes and everything while just being home all the time is kind of uh, not fun. And uh, I, th I would say the worst part about it is that because I'm in my office all day for class and then doing research in my office all day, and then when I relax, if I play video games or something, I'm also in my office, my computer. <laughs> I'm basically just sitting at a desk all day long, and it's not that great. So I have to get out more and do more stuff. Yeah, I have to say, I love your um, social media posting. It's like he, he posts this like, sarcastic and cynical view on being a PhD student within the um, electrical engineering department at UNLV. Yeah, I, I know. I'm not sure. After following more PhD students on Twitter, I'm not sure that there's any that don't have a uh, cynical view on it. It's a. <laughs> It's a pretty torturous process, to be honest. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I don't want to butcher exactly what you do, so can you um, explain to everyone? We'll just go through the backstory in the beginning. I always do that because I think that the backstory is important to kind of your mission statement uh, going forward. So just talk about um, just childhood, how you ended up in Vegas, and leading up to being a PhD student. Okay. So I was born in Highland Park, Illinois, and I lived there for the first eight years of my life. And... We moved out to Las Vegas when my, because my parents decided to move back out here. They had actually met in the dorms at UNLV, <laughs> and uh, they moved out to Illinois for some work for my dad, and then decided to come back because he liked it here so much. And over time, I just decided that this is kind of like the place where I like to be it for now. And my dad works at UNLV, so it always seemed kind of like a good fit. My brother went there, my mom went there. Uh, we're just kind of like a UNLV family. And so for high school, I went to Las Vegas Academy. It's a magnet school for performing visual arts and international studies. And I studied music there for a while and was always really good at math as well. And as a result, kind of unsure about what I wanted to do going into college. And at the time, UNLV came out with this major called entertainment engineering. And it seemed like a pretty good blend of, you know, the mathematics and engineering side of things while still getting to flex my creative muscle. And as I did that more and more, I realized that I kind of just like was getting hungrier for the engineering side of things. I wanted like more rigorous mathematics, more like advanced scientific stuff, more, you know, futuristic things. And uh, it started off actually for a while I was thinking about leaving engineering to follow music production. And that's why I went over to uh, I studied in Spain at the Berklee School of Music in Valencia for three weeks. And had a great time there. Learned from this wonderful electronic musician named Ben and Cantel. He uh, is the DJ behind the Zebler and Canty experience. If you want to look him up sometime, awesome group. I'm gonna have to. <laughs> and uh, so spent three weeks out there. Learned a lot about music. Also learned that as great as music is, it was more of a hobby for me, and I really wanted to pursue engineering more. And so I took a robotics class the next semester and fell in love with that. And that's when I started doing robotics research. And that's when I wanted to pursue my master's in electrical engineering. And so it took a while to do to get into that, just like jump through some hoops. And I finally got into the program and spent three years working on my master's because I was kind of unsure about like what actual major I wanted to select and uh, between mechanical and electrical. And then I was approached by one of the electrical engineering professors to work on this project that was developing a some type of assistive technology that will translate the language of nonverbal individuals. And what that means is that whenever um, a, someone with some type of nonverbal disability, they have a caretaker generally or family members who will learn over time what it is that they're trying to speak or say to them, whether it's like through facial expressions different noises that they're making, things along that line. And we want to find some way to get all that information and make it generalizable so that they don't have to rely on someone with them 24-7 to get their needs met. So they could, let's say, go to a coffee shop or whatever and tell someone what they want without having someone there with them 
to always like uh, translate for them. So that's kind of like, was that kind of like how Professor Stephen Hawking was, where he wasn't able to communicate, but he had, um, I don't know if, if, if it was like a brain interface or if it was just like a small finger movement that um, transmitted his thoughts onto a screen, but it's more similar, less kind of like that situation. Yeah, it is very similar to the technology behind that. And um, I'm not entirely familiar with the exact type of technology that he used, but if I remember correctly, it was some type of combination of either... Um, eye tracking or being able to like look at a certain letter and have it match up with like uh basically like a very mild brain computer interface type situation and so it's very similar to that but the idea is that we want it to be something that is uh a cheap enough that it's not relegated to you know people who are famous for it you know we don't want it to, you do have to have a big name for this to be able to apply to you mm -hmm. and so we're developing more affordable ways to, de to develop the technology we're also working on algorithms that'll make it more generalizable so that we can like say all right we have the system and although it's really well fit to this person it only takes a few steps to re like shape it or whatever we need to this person's needs Okay, yeah, so it sounds like there's kind of a few different disciplines that kind of combine this, whereas there's robotics, there's um, deep AI learning, and then you have some sort of like neural interface as well. And I know uh, like neurology seems to be the at least pop culture trend from what I see. It's like everyone's all trying to dive into the neurological field. Yeah. Uh, yeah, neuroscience is kind of like the, or at least what I've been studying a lot of uh, like, I guess the cutting edge of where everything's headed right now, because uh, like you were saying with deep neural networks, they're finding, or at least in some of the research that I've been doing, that we don't necessarily need to rely on the learning aspect of deep neural networks. So these, the whole like, all right, we have these big networks that we have to train over thousands and thousands of iterations to get any type of classification out of. That's great and all, but not every neuron in the brain requires training or learning. There's some neurons that just act. And they don't require these like, you know, excessive training iterations or whatever. And so we need to account for those when we design these networks. And so a lot of the networks and stuff that I actually work on right now uh, don't really rely, fall into the deep learning area. They fall more into the, um, I guess what would be called like deep brain simulations. And so um, like, for example, what would be a good project? I'm working on this project right now where I'm extending the research from that came out of University of Waterloo and applied brain research. They work on this framework called NENGO and it's uh, for deep brain simulations. And what they do is they try to figure out how to simulate different regions of the brain to get as close to human like behavior as possible so that we can understand more about how the brain works. Because the idea is that if we can simulate all of these areas to get human like behavior, and then we can start to increase the simulations and start to take different parts out or mess with different parts and see how it affects the brain without having to mess with anyone's neurology. And that's great because so much of what we want to do is kind of like not possible because we, you know, don't want to be invasive and mess with people's brains in that sense. And that's why like, um, for example, Neuralink, Elon Musk's company, a lot of the stuff that they're talking about, the research behind it is just, it's good and it's, it's something that's done in a lot of places, but it's still mostly done on animals because it's hard to find people who a, are willing to get a chip implanted <laughs> directly onto their brain. And also it's hard to make sure that that's going to be 100% safe for them and not completely screw them up because we still find even when we're putting electrodes directly onto monkey brains and stuff that one of the biggest issues is that the area where the electrodes inserted just kills so many neurons. And that's not good for anyone. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. It's, so would you say that the, um, ethical, um, understanding behind it is probably what the biggest obstacle to this, um, to, I guess the experiments that are done in this discipline? Yeah, I would say, or at least, um, and when it comes to applicability to humans, yeah. And, uh, that's not to say that, oh, ethics are getting, they're in our way for a very, very good reason. <laughs> and so that's why it's so important to, that's why I want to develop these ways that, uh, you know, don't circumvent the ethics, so to speak, but they rather help uh, improve our understanding of the science without having to do these invasive uh, procedures. Or even the ethical procedures that are invasive, they can still have long-lasting effects. And so I just, you know, don't feel comfortable 
using research that has any kind of long lasting negative effects on people when we can find other ways. And that's another reason why a lot of the research that I do when it comes to nonverbal disabilities right now is still theoretical in the sense that I'm still working on developing models and systems that work for a healthy person because I want to make sure this stuff works before we start, you know, going through the IRB approval because I don't want to go through trials and trials and trials of people with nonverbal disabilities and making them uncomfortable for something that's not going to work, you know? It's just not, it, it doesn't feel right. And so uh, that's kind of where I come from, where I want to start developing methods that really improve our understanding without having to be invasive. Yeah, I guess that, that makes sense because um, people who have nonverbal um, disabilities, there's something, some specific region that's wrong. But if you're practicing on somebody or an animal that has a full, um, I guess, composure of their brain, you're able to isolate the specific regions and understand what exactly is going on there. Right. And there's... It, so there's that when it comes to animals, there's also just the ability to, because we have the, um, you know, ability to implant the electrodes directly, the signal quality and stuff and the amount of research that we're able to do is much greater on that type of data than it is on, like, the stuff that you've seen me wear, where it's all mounted directly to my scalp. Because all of that that's taking electrical signals that's penetrating through, you know, your cranium, skin, blood, all that stuff, and then picking up all the surrounding noise. Whereas getting it right onto the head, you're getting all of the signal that you need. Right. Yeah, that's the, the famous picture that uh, J- Jaden was actually on. Was it the uh, School of Engineering magazine for UNLV or was it the complete? It was there. Yeah, it was the School of Engineering. I think they're like semester catalog or something. Yeah, um, I'll put the picture in the show notes. But it's literally like out of a science fiction <laughs> film. Jaden standing there in a suit. Um, and his hands are pronated. And there's electricity coming out of it. And he has this this brain scanning imaging thing on his head. It's like something you see out of a movie where it covers your scalp and there's like um, electrodes that, and it attaches to different parts of your brain. And this is uh, something that Jaden had built while he was getting his master's degree, correct? So it's, it's worth noting. Yeah, I didn't design and build it. That's actually a product uh, offered by OpenBCI, their company that's based out of New York. But that's one of the things that I use for developing the systems. And um, I've actually been working with OpenBCI lately to uh, work on some like projects with them. So um, I will have like I- ideally more input on some development on further products in the future. It'd be mm-hmm. nice, but we'll see as that goes. Right now we're working on a um, on a summer project where we're trying to crowdsource data from basically anyone who has one of these headsets anywhere. And so I'm helping them write a protocol that we can you know send to these people and say, hey, put this headset on, run this software, send us back the data, and then we're going to analyze it. When they have the um, headset on, is there any sort of specific thought that you ask them to think about, or they just put it on and kind of just chill for a second? So uh, when we're doing brain-computer interface experiments, we have what are called paradigms that are, represent the different types of experiments that we use. And so they're all leveraged for different purposes and can be hacked, so to speak, to uh, make different systems. So one of the systems that we use is called um, ERPs, event-related potentials or evoked response potential, depending on which literature you read it from. And uh, what it is is that basically anytime there's a certain event that you register in the brain, there's a very uh, prominent wave a certain amount of milliseconds after that event. So, for example, there's the P300 where it's um, your anticipatory uh, potential, essentially. So if you're waiting to see, like, okay, someone says you're going to see a dog and they show you a bunch of pictures of random images. Once you see the dog, because you're anticipating it, that P300 will uh, spike 300 milliseconds after you see it. And similarly, like the, uh, we use the N170 is a negative peak 170 milliseconds after that shows that you've seen a human face. And so we can show you a bunch of pictures or whatever of random images. And once there's a face in there, we'll know that you've seen the face, but just by reading your brain images. Huh. And so when there is um, an anticipatory spike, what happens? Is there like a, does it, does it show um, anxiety in the person as well? Because I know when people um, anticipate things, it can build up anxiety. Does that have an effect on the scanning as well? Uh, it could, certainly. There are definitely um, methods to figuring out what like someone's anxiety levels from the brain waves, but the processing methods that you use kind of uh, help like phase that out. So anxiety, for example, would be like 
that would be a measure of the strength of different waves at like over a period of time. Whereas this is more of just like, okay, there's a peak in this wave at the specific time. So we're kind of looking for two different measurements in that sense. Okay. And um, in the same vein, so like the strength of certain waves over time is useful when doing a paradigm like motor imagery, for example. And in motor imagery, we ask people, okay, so for these few seconds, we want you to think about moving your right arm, then think about moving your left, you know, all different types of limbs and record the data. And then you need to classify, okay, the strength of the waves at different parts, like when they're imagining things at different areas of their brain, that shows that they're imagining that. And so the idea is that if you train it well enough on someone imagining moving their right arm, then when you classify that, they can, in theory, control a robot arm just by imagining it. Uh, and that would probably be good for people who lose a body part or have like the phantom limb syndrome. Right, right. Which um, I hear is very common. And um, I have a family member who lost um, a foot and they say that they still have that like feeling of moving foot left to right, even yeah. though it's not even there or even like a cramping sensation. Right. And it's really interesting because so where we can start. So the the brain computer interfacing and the deep brain simulations that I've been talking about are technically two kind of disparate fields that I'm working to connect and bring together. For example, um, like you were saying, we can use that to for someone to control a robotic limb or whatever, robotic uh, robo prosthetic. We can also, there's been research that's been done where they control robot arms using a simulated version of the human motor cortex. And so if we can, if we develop the controller that controls this robot arm based on the human motor cortex and use that and then you know, line it up with readings from that person's actual motor cortex, I think it would make a much more like um, intuitive control of the robot arm for the, for the amputee. Wow. The future. And you see some of these, um, you can go ahead and get a drink. <laughs> I, see, I see you reaching for it. But um, I see, especially with the uh, prosthetics, I've seen that some people have started doing that already and that the nature of the prosthetics now are becoming much more um like exact and they're able to move and not just uh, like 90 degree angles like they like they used to I see people uh moving their fingers in like a 360 and kind of like a curling and extension motion which is really cool for that kind of field yeah and um so that's I think a lot of the research around those right now I don't know how many of those exist straight from brainwave reading another form of brain computer interfacing is that um i guess the air quotes don't really <laughs> transfer over so it, hel well. it helps <laughs> us <laughs> uh, another method of brain computer interfacing is that you use um emg sensors or muscle sensors and so let's say someone's uh amputated right here or whatever you can stick the prosthetic arm and then connect muscle sensors around there and it'll be able to tell okay so you're moving this or whatever all right now flex these fingers and work it along those lines. And it's still considered to be brain-computer interfacing because it still originates from a thought. And it originates from a thought in the same way that, you know, we find when people are doing these motor imagery experiments, like, okay, imagining their right arm moving, the muscles in their right arm are actually being activated. They're just not activated in a way that makes it actually move. But mm -hmm. it's the same way where I think they hooked up... Um, it was uh, EMG sensors to a professional NHL player. I don't remember who it was and uh, brainwave sensors. And we're having them watch someone play hockey. And we're finding out that as they're watching the person play hockey, at, they're just sitting still. Their muscles that would line up with the movements that person was making were active. Hmm. And so they're like sitting there watching someone skate and they're sitting still. But there's still these little micro uh, movements in the muscles that would be like they're skating in a way. It's micro simulation. It's interesting. It's like, uh, and so there's so all these set, there's all these ideas and stuff that we can. All right, if we can just figure out how to get those sen those signals or whatever, then we can do so much. Like, um, I think it was out of MIT. They did a uh, they developed this product called the Jawbone, and it's a EMG sensor that rests along the lines of like literally along your jawbone. And it lets you speak to someone without saying anything. Because if you sit there and just look at them and imagine what you're saying, your mouth is actually making micro movements and the muscles are moving. And so they can decode what it is you're trying to say. And you can speak to someone without talking. Jesus, we're literally, it's like while you're saying that, it just makes you think like the human body is the hardware and then the brain is pretty much the software that runs the entire machine. Oh, yeah. Our brain is just a big squishy circuit. <laughs> so... If you're able to dive into these different like neuro neurological pathways, 
can you um, like almost dictate what somebody's going to do before beforehand? So it's interesting. There's uh, not really, I guess, and there's I guess probably some better people to ask on this because mm-hmm. still my background is more from the computational side of things. But uh, I have been reading more so into the uh, into neuroscience theory. Like I'm taking a cellul- cellular molecular neuroscience course next semester, but. I want to say no, because I remember reading uh, this passage recently from, it was uh, regarding the idea of free will in neurons. And so we find that what we study in neurons is that there's a spike somewhere. And so when you activate a neuron, you basically feed it this volt that gets fed this voltage or whatever until it reaches a threshold value or fed current until it reaches the threshold value. And then it spikes voltage spikes and then it comes back down and these spikes are how neurons communicate with each other and um crap, I don't <laughs> what, what was talking about free will yeah, yeah so we find that um this current that is required for the voltage spike we find that okay so we run tests where we feed it this exact voltage the threshold value and okay in theory you feed it the threshold value should spike every time it doesn't though what we find is that when the when the neuron is held at the voltage value, whether or not it spikes and when it spikes is indeterminate. We don't know. It's you can't determine it from it, and so that kind of like uh, I guess randomness, so to speak, is where it's kind of like I guess the origination, or maybe not the origination, but where free will could kind of lie in the sense that as much as you boil down us down to these little tiny circuit elements, there's still that level of indeterminacy that we can't account for. And so there's got to be some type of, like, free will in that regard. But then I guess that also gets into what your definition of free will and yeah. is because that's a whole different conversation, which I'm willing to get into. <laughs> that's, that's honestly, it's re- relieving. I think, um, you know, growing up with The Sims, everyone thinks, like, what, what if we're, like, a Sims character being controlled and how simulation theory is the most common or I guess most popular and popular theory now behind um, just like where the universe lies. It used to be string theory, and now it's kind of moved into the simulation theory. And if that's the case, then there wouldn't be th- free will because we'd be a simulation. Yeah, um, I guess. I don't know that that's necessarily still true because the simulations themselves are not determinate. We run simulations all the time in the academic world where we want to run tests and think, okay, this is what the output should be but it's not. And so why is that? Or sometimes the output is what it should be, but it's because we didn't model the real world effects properly. And so it's like the idea of like, um, you know, the joke when you're doing physics in college is like, you always say in theory after everything, because you're not (laughs) accounting for like uh, air resistance, friction, all that stuff or whatever. And that's exactly it. There's all this stuff that happens in theory that would make it deterministic, but it doesn't actually happen. And so the same thing I think applies still to that like simulation idea is that, okay, even if we are a simulation, the very like core concept of running simulations in science is that you want to figure out what's going to happen. And if you knew what was going to happen, then you wouldn't need to run the simulation. And that makes, that makes total sense. That's like when you run a simulation for a video game, you're just setting like the parameters and waiting to see the end result. Exactly. And like, you know, the whole thing is that as video games get more and more advanced, they are literally just that, is simulations. And that's why you find people who are, you know, I write uh, simulations or um, interfaces and stuff in Unity, which is a game development software, because it is just, you know, it's all physics. They have like, okay, wind, all that stuff that you need and everything that will help you get this higher fidelity model to really, really test what the actual effects will be. Huh. Well, I just have to say, I hope we do have free will at the, at the, at the end of the day. <laughs> I mean, I think we do because... So th- when you study, like, uh, I guess making choices in the sense that, like, okay, control theory, you're studying something making choices, uh, it might result in their choice as a probability distribution of, like, okay, they're likely to, they're more likely to make this choice, but, like, you know, 10% of the time they make this weird choice that's an outlier. And so I think free will, in a sense, is just our own versions of our own individual probability distributions. Like, some of us are more likely to select some things than others, but that probability distribution, I think, is a result of our free will and not vice versa. And that, because we can sit here and think, okay, if we study all of our personal decisions for the remainder of our lives, we can get an idea of what we're most likely to select. And then we can sit there and go, you know what? I'm going to change this. I'm just going to select the outlier every single time Mm -hmm. from now on, completely aware of that knowledge. And then you screw up the probability distribution. And so, like, 
at a certain point it becomes you can't really argue against free will i don't think yeah that's um have you seen the new season of westworld uh i've only seen the first like two episodes i think okay yeah there that's a big proponent now that it just I had that epiphany while you're talking about it about um, I forget what Jess, Jesse Pinkman's character I forget what his name is I don't want to ruin it for you but he basically there's like a governing AI over the, over the entire city and but then there's these um, outliers that kind of just like fuck up the entire thing and that the AI can't effectively govern the entire um, society because they have these few outliers that basically just run amok over the entire system. Yeah, uh, just that seems a little um, unrealistic just from the standpoint of uh, in AI research, like a big um, topic is figuring out how to account for outliers. And so I feel like if they ever get to that governing AI, it probably should have been able to account for outliers a while back. (laughs) Yeah, they they had to call them the divergence. (laughs) Yeah, I guess that maybe I I guess I I don't know enough about uh, future predictions to understand how the um, I guess like governing ai system would work but but you have studied a decent amount into ai itself correct oh yeah i yeah i've done a lot of studying into just like you know our current deep neural networks and how to build them what they do and the theory behind them and then also the uh, more like i was saying kind of the side where it bridges away from the deep neural networks because all this stuff that you see like um like google investing in and these companies that do image classification they the algorithms for deep neural networks are based on how we know neurons to perform, but they don't perform like we know them to perform. And that's a pretty big issue if you're trying to go into actual developing human-like intelligence. So there's like a, uh, I guess there's, um, oh, I just read this yesterday. So a big uh, difference between the fields of artificial intelligence and like the neuroscience that I've been bridging more into is that just replicating the output isn't all that's necessary. So if you develop a system that knows how to play chess and beats people, that's of interest to people who study artificial intelligence because they're just creating the artificial version of the intelligence. But for people studying neuroscience, it's not of interest unless that's actually has um, biological plausibility. And so there's certain things with the way that we know neurons perform, like the amount of information that they transmit per cycle or just the types of functions that they use, we know are not actually biologically plausible. And so those models aren't necessarily of interest to neuroscientists. I mean, they are because it helps inform their idea of what can be done, but they're not exactly the same thing, if that makes sense. <laughs> Brains are inferior technology. <laughs> uh, no, Or actually. it might be the other way around. Yeah, because the idea is that these, you know, these neural networks that they build to perform... Um, you know, massive computations for image processes require all of these massive data centers to do all the processing and stuff and all this power. And our brain does it with, you know, what we run on. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Our brains require such low energy to do all these crazy high computational processes that like it's a, it's a wonder. So what makes, so some AIs are just seem really advanced. Is that just because they're very specific in nature that makes them able to to calculate like a lot of these different probabilities or like how the finance sector, a lot of uh, trading um, is not actually humans. Like 70% of it is AI algorithms. Does that make them so far superior just because they're created into a specific niche? Yeah, it's, um, it's what I like to personally call the barrier between, I guess, like... Uh, artificial intelligence and machine intelligence and that it's studying something that is very machine like you know we don't have people who we don't process things that exact degree when it comes to stock trading or whatever we're not like sitting there and figuring out okay i mean some people do but you're not doing the exact calculations at the speed and everything that the machine is able to do because it's just not information that you're able to really be privy to 24 7 and so it's kind of like uh it's where i kind of make the difference between machine intelligence and artificial intelligence is that the machine intelligence does things that you would expect a machine to do and not really a person in a way that that machine that's trading stocks 24 7 is never going to make you a pancake okay that makes sense and so so machine learning is more specific artificial can be able to process maybe multiple variables at one time and come to a decision yeah or even i would say uh and this is really just more of a personal distinction. Um, plenty of people have other things to say on this. I would 
personally for me it's more of a distinction of like the you know artificial intelligence can do image classification for example and that makes sense because we look at images and say okay that's a person that's a dog or whatever that's something that our we're very clear our brain can do naturally and so i think that makes more sense or even like chess for example because that's playing a game we as humans play games but we don't sit there and feed, you know, like hundreds of stock data into our brain and then like, you know, run these algorithms or whatever. Some people do, but I, I would I would wager that they don't even do it to the speed and the efficiency that those machine intelligence algorithms do, which is why they exist. I think so. I think also, too, if we try to process all that, like machine learning does, I think our emotions or our energy is like our limiting bandwidth factor right. to that. <laughs> right. And that's one of the things is that these big deep neural networks are so great about because they're requ well they require so much data or not all of them do anymore it's one of the advancements of them but is that they historically have required so many computation iterations so much power so much like uh so many resources to do things that we can do with this little squishy ball of salt and whatever the hell it is <laughs> hmm so i love ai but there is the common fear that AI can take over. And Elon Musk is probably the biggest public figure on this. Um, <laughs> Jaden's over here laughing already. Um, could there ever be an AI takeover? Or or maybe like, or is that just not plausible because of we're the creators of it and therefore we can limit the bandwidth for them to be able to figure out how to... I guess, compute emotions and make sound decisions that are logical from a human standard? So, all right, I guess there's a few opinions. I have a few opinions on this. <laughs> Firstly being that I think the fear of an AI taking over is much less real than the fear of some type of uh, corporate entity using AI to take over. And so meaning like, and I mean, what they do now, you know, mass surveillance, things like that, where they use these AI algorithms that, yeah, they don't need a super intelligent computer or whatever to predict everyone's movements, but that's because they have all these tiny little algorithms that are basically do that for them. And so I think we're at much more risk of these technologies being put into the wrong hands and that kind of being the takeover. I don't think we're at so much of a risk of some type of super intelligence uh, taking us over before we take over ourselves. So it's like compartmentalizing each different sector and then taking over each one and yeah, I mean, it. Yeah, like, you know, Amazon knows basically what you want to buy before you know. <laughs> uh, Google can tell where you're going to be basically at any point based on your you know, history. Dude, yeah, Gmail even does that now when you type an email and it'll give you, like, the suggestion on right. what you want to finish. It's, it's very yeah, freaky. And it's, <laughs> and it's, like, it, it's not even just, like, general words. It's, like, what you would say, too. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, so things like that will let the evil people in, the pow in power take over before the AI gets to take over. If anything, I would say, uh, given the trend of, you know evil corporations likely going to take us over in that regard using mass surveillance, we could hope for a super AI to fight them back, <laughs> if anything, because that's kind of, it's going to be our only hope sooner or later, I feel like. Like, um, there's a lot of ethical considerations now when working in AI research, even if you don't mean it for nefarious purposes whatsoever. There is, like, uh, I think his name is PJ Reddy. He is a really famous computer vision researcher. Um developed one of the most famous uh, object recognition and tracking algorithms. It's called uh, YOLO. <laughs> you only look once. And uh, so it's a very, very fast algorithm that finds whatever object in an image and tracks its position in the image in real time. It's fantastic. He recently quit computer vision research because of the ethical considerations because his algorithms are now being used in missile guidance systems and surveillance systems and things like that. And, like, you know, not even, like, algorithms that were, like, uh, you know, designed in the same way as his. Like, his algorithms that he d that are being cited and put into these things. And he feels bad about it, and rightfully so. And it brings up the question, like, sure, his algorithms are being used in things like auto uh, pilot for driving systems and things like that, which will have a objectively positive outcome where reducing the amount of driving fatalities is the reduction in driving fatalities worth the increase in government surveillance and these guided missiles that can kill people without anyone having any say whatsoever? 
And, you know, it's for him, it wasn't, apparently, which yeah, I can't necessarily disagree with. I mean, I'm very against the amount of driving fatalities that we have, but on the grand scheme of things, maybe we just need to be better drivers. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to have better infrastructure yeah. around that. Yeah. Well, we do, we do have um, self-driving. I know it's still far off, but hopefully that can um, fix that situation. But I didn't even think about the ethical concerns. You would think that most of the time when you think of ethics, you think of like biological processes. Like, um, like for example, um, I forget the doctor's name who created CRISPR, which is the um, gene splicer where they could go in and basically um, artificially um, fix whatever you have in the genome. And that's what you think of as more as like, is that ethical or not? Cause then you can have base, basically you could customize your babies however you want, red hair, um, bigger in muscle composition, intelligence, whatever you want. So you think that more in biological, but once you start getting into the AI field, you start thinking like what kind of mass destruction this could do. Yeah, exactly. And just how it affects the general population. And I guess, you know, I think a lot about ethics in regards to how it affects uh, people, I guess, just because of my background in nonverbal disabilities, that's a huge aspect of getting research done is that because they don't have the agency to speak for themselves in a way that's understandable to everyone, you need to be absolutely 100% sure that you're not making them uncomfortable, you're not infringing on their, you know, agency, their livelihood in any way, shape or form, or taking advantage of them. It's very important. And so that's kind of, you know, why I see now a lot of the stuff that I, you know, a lot of the stuff in the world that's now kind of the lens that I look at it at is that are there people that it's being told that it's benefiting, but are actually being taken advantage of. And like, I find that it happens a lot. And do you see, at least from your experience, do you see a lot of um, AI, I guess we'll call them scientists uh, migrating more into like the, um, I guess more ethical decisions and less into like manufacturing AI weapons and different targeting systems and whatever falls in that field. Oh, yeah, uh, there's it definitely is a lot more ethical um, talks amongst the AI researcher world right now. But there's still, I think, just a lot of people who and there's always going to be the people who just don't care about the ethics behind it and are smart enough to get the work done still. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate. It's like either you face that moral quandary, like, OK, do I do the work if it's to combat the people using it for nefarious purposes or do I just, you know, wipe my hands clean of it altogether and do the more ethical thing? entirely that's the that's the money talks it's capitalism yeah, that's yeah. fine it pushes innovation forward but it can also turn into cronyism yeah i, I it hasn't pushed innovation forward so much lately unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> so been... we'll, we'll dive out of ai and i know um your degree specific has uh, a few other fields that you are more specific towards correct yeah so actually do you think we can hop back on the, eth the whole idea let's do it thing? let's do it so one other thing i want to touch on in the ethics is that uh just kind of like and this is just kind of like a i guess statement or throwing it out there one of the issues i've been having kind of internally when it comes to the morals behind all of this is um you know i develop things that work for nonverbal individuals but as we one of the things that the coronavirus talk about the vaccine showed me that they were saying like, oh, the vaccine or treatment is going to cost $3,000. And so only the rich are going to be able to get into that stuff. And so it got me thinking, I work and I'm developing stuff that's out there to help people. But if it's ever going to be put up behind some type of paywall, do I still feel comfortable doing that? Because like, I, you know, and it's a little bit, I guess, different for me that I don't have to worry about it too much because in the end, I'm still helping the people with nonverbal disabilities and they don't even have the agency to, you know, be terrible <laughs> people, I guess. I mean, maybe they do. I don't know enough about that, but, um, you know, I'm still helping people that are going to benefit from it regardless. But on the topic of developing like vaccines or something, if you know your vaccine's only going to be used by, let's say, the like the top 1% of people who are, actively safeguarding it from other people, I start to feel like there's some ethical considerations when making that. If, you know, you're just going to be developing something that only saves the top 1% specifically so that they can safeguard it from the others. Yeah, and you even saw that even a month ago when the tests were first starting to get produced. Um, a lot of the sports leagues had it first. I mean, not taking away from Joe Rogan. Thanks. Joe Rogan has been administering tests every time he goes through a lot of these other... Um, famous people had got their hands on it exactly. months before everyone else. And it's like, how, how exactly? How? And like, you know, it's, we're in a place right now where sure they're getting it first, but at least, you know, the, it'll still eventually trickle down to the, uh, every man. 
but I fear that we're headed to a place where that's not always going to be the situation. And I mean, still in this, for the coronavirus treatment, sure, but for many other treatments, we're already in that situation where it's just that it doesn't trickle down to other people because they just can't afford it and so they don't get their treatment, they die. And it's awful. I guess that makes sense too. Um, with AI, I've, I've seen that they're creating AI systems to um, discover like cancer and different um, diseases within people. And you figure that'll probably be... Um, guaranteed first to people who have the highest health insurance, which is usually like the top 1%. Yeah, something like, yeah, we'll see. Um, I find that, uh, I don't know how far we are out from those still being applicable because I think they even did a, re a study showing that um, it was, I think, Google that had some type of medical AI recently that had that showed some crazy accuracy one on their data set. And then when mobilized in the real world, it just completely like, different yeah it was just terrible it just never got a correct or maybe it did get some correct predictions but it was just like so inaccurate they couldn't even like tout its results yeah you, you can't test on um people who have been you know smoking for 50 years or done all these different things throughout their life that have caused imbalances in their brain which therefore would make it harder to test on right or even just you know the main problem with or one of the topics in any when you're learning AI and deep learning and stuff is that you need data that represents the natural distribution of data. And so you need, like if you're studying something like, um, you know, cancer legions in a certain area of the body, you need data from people who've developed cancer from like every type of cause or whatever. Cause if you only get it from like, all right, smoking this type of like tobacco or whatever, when there's other causes to that type of cancer as well, then you're only going to be able to classify it when it was those people. Yeah, there's so many, so many different variables, region, um, health diet, um, genetics in the family. Yeah. There's, there's a ton. Yeah. Well, I hope, um, I hope the ethical concerns are, have a lot of awareness. I, I didn't even think about it um, at the time before you brought it up. I thought it was more biological ethical concerns, but yeah. AI, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, we, we often think biological because uh, especially when you're going through um, IRB certification to be able to do research on... Um, What's the, IRB? Uh, the Internal Review Board. Okay. And so they're the ones who basically say, okay, yeah, your research is ethical. You're allowed to do this and we're not going to get sued and you're not going to get sued for it. And... Um, so when you go through the training, they do talk a lot about how a lot of the rules for the internal review board come from, you know, Nazi scientists, essentially, because all, all of what they did was so unethical and uh, things like that. Just like, all right, that's kind of why we think I think so much about the biological aspect of it, because a lot of what they did was very biological. Yeah, you still you still even nobody even knows for sure what the Nazis did as far as um, biological testing. But everyone knows that there was something that was done and it's represented through different texts and books. And oh, yeah, there's uh, it's unfortunate. Like, I mean, a lot of scientific advancements that I guess or I don't know how many of them, but we did give Nazi scientists, unfortunately, like passes and stuff and fate and trading for the research that they did that past a lot of ethical considerations that we can do ourselves and it's unfortunate because that gets like that then gets touted by these neo-nazis as like you know a reason why they weren't so bad or whatever <laughs> it's like no 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 they were bad they shouldn't we shouldn't have given them that pass even if we did take the research for whatever reasons like it's not okay yeah and i, I hear those um testing is um, being reflected in some other countries right now. I don't want to name it and even dive. I don't even want to dive down that rabbit <laughs> yeah, hole, yeah. but you do, you do hear remnants of that happening all over again. Yeah. It's oh very, yeah. It's very scary. Yeah. And that's why things like IRB are so great to make sure that nothing happens where you take away someone's agency or do something that takes advantage of them. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's hop back out of this again though. Uh, yeah. And um, I know as we were talking before, you were saying that your degree has like a few different um, discipline focuses, correct? Yeah. So uh, my technically, technically my specialization is in what's called control theory. And that's just uh, the idea of how you control any type of system, whether it's a robotic system, a circuit, like a voltage level, or a good example is like, let's say um, resource management things like that, just how do you allocate certain things in the optimal way or to reach your goal, things along that line. And so that's kind of where the whole robotics aspect of my research comes in because it's all just about, all right, we can control it to stay in place. Can we control it to follow a trajectory? Can we control it to generalize between different environments, things like that. And then I also specialize in computational neuroscience, but that's more of like a, uh, a specialization that I built up myself just by like learning about the brain computer interfacing and stuff like that 
and then trying to um, take classes within the neuroscience department. So that's not an actual um, specialization you could go to. It's just a combination of uh, understanding and having um, great knowledge in a few different specializations. Yeah, there's there's schools that do have it as a specialization, but UNLV is not one of them. Oh, that's pretty yeah. cool. It makes you even more unique. Yeah, it's nice. It, it's a little uh, it makes it difficult at times because I guess um, not a lot of professors there and know really, I guess, the stuff that I'm trying to like research into. And so I do have to like kind of at times get my information from other sources and reach out to other professors at other universities, but it works out at the end. I think that's kind of what uh, makes a good, I guess, like PhD student dissertation is their ability to not just like stay within the confines of their own university's education and still reach out and get more worldly input on their so stuff. are you uh, then for your dissertation since it is so unique literally one of a kind within the unlv um school does it make it hard for a professor whoever is overseeing this program to i guess give you is it a pass or a fail is that how that works for a dissertation uh, to get your phd yeah so it's um yeah, there's like a few things that it's more or less pass or fail, but it's like you have to do a qualifying exam you have to pass that. Then you have to pass your like um, proposal where you propose your idea. Then you have to defend your idea. Then I think there's like another exam that you have to pass. But yeah, so when it comes to the dissertation, it I guess it would make it more difficult in the sense that if they're really sticklers in the sense that it's kind of like a luck of the draw with the professors, I would say. Because I was very lucky in my master's thesis to get professors that, although they didn't know the exact area of what I was doing, some of them knew signal processing, some of them knew control theory, some of them knew, uh, you know, met, uh, medical stuff and our medicine and biomedical engineering. And so they were all able to say, like, okay, that, that part of this is sound. And so, like, as long as you have, like, okay, all the individual parts of it are good, it makes sense that the, you know, uh, accumulation of it is all good as well and so that's kind of where I am going for my you have a committee when doing a dissertation and so that's kind of the mindset of it like I have my PI Dr. Pushkin Kachru he is a control theory and dynamics whiz he, he's a whiz in everything he's literally <laughs> the smartest human being I've ever <laughs> met in my life he's doing his third PhD right now <sighs> in physics yeah uh, he did his he just did his master's theorem on working on uh, Godel's incompleteness theorem. It's crazy stuff. And dude is well, what was that? He said that again? Godel's incompleteness theorem. Uh, oh, so that's based off of somebody who created that theorem? Yeah. it's. Uh, let me look this up because I'm going to get it wrong. <laughs> but the theorem is like is awesome. It's it's like uh, it's very prominent in um, in quantum physics. Yeah, it's some, something too that I always find when um, – when I'm just interested in a different topic and when I'm listening to a bunch of different people who are highly more educated than me in theoretical physics, I always look up these different um, theorems or theories that are based off somebody. And it's usually some, but something that's like highly specialized, but really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's looking out here. He had to pull this out just for corrective verification, just to make sure that you didn't get if it I wrong. If I don't find it, we can just cut this part. That's that's how you know that it's uh, that he's very science based once and zeros. He's like, I have to I have to get this right. I cannot get this wrong in any, any way possible or mess it up. It's almost like a dishonor to the person who made it. <laughs> I, re I respect it, though. Yeah. So I'd, I would definitely get this wrong if I tried to just even talk about it off reading that uh, <laughs> small bit but basically the idea of the incompleteness theorem is that some proofs of some concepts the fact that we don't have all of the pieces to it is that's proof in and of itself is that like certain elements of it are so far out of our reach or ability to prove that like it's proof in and of itself huh. yeah it's uh it, it kind of makes sense when you start to realize that the whole idea of quantum theory i guess is like um things having dual representation you know it being either one or zero or both somehow mm -hmm. with the chaos theory yeah and in, intact within that yeah chaos is crazy <laughs> concept man <laughs> Just, oh. Qua quant i've always found quantum physics and quantum theory very i mean it is obviously complex but when you get down to like the smallest unit that it's just like there's like you're saying there's two identical representations of i don't even know it's not even an atom I don't know, what's it called a quark right or something on the quantum levels yeah and how there's like two of them but yet every microsecond or whatever it is they're like switching positions 
Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. I, I'm unfortunately not so well versed in physics or quantum theory, so I uh, can't talk in conference too much about it. But the whole mm-hmm. the whole idea is crazy, and I do want to get more into it because as I've been reading more about neuroscience, they're finding that a lot of the um, uh, like what I talked about the indeterminacy, uh, ex- for example, earlier. That's kind of how that's quantum indeterminacy relate. It uh, relates to quantum indeterminacy and the fact that it's holding that position, that threshold value that we don't know if it's going to fire or not. And we don't know if it's going to be a one or a zero. It could be both, or so could, one could happen at any point. The other could happen at any point. And so it's the same kind of uh, aspect in that I believe there's even like theory that relates the quantum physics of that to actually how we speak or actually how we think. Hmm. That makes sense because if you can't pinpoint the exact location, then therefore it is somewhat of a quote unquote free will yeah. kind of yeah the kind of idea yeah we we can't the whole idea is that free will is gone when you can determine everything and if we can't determine it so hmm. it's, it's interesting and I do see quantum there are now like quantum computers or at least they're trying to develop it I saw uh, IBM I think was one that just released recently yeah they uh you can actually. I think like go onto their website and write code for the quantum computer and like run it on it, which is pretty cool. But uh, it's, I saw it at CES one year. It looks amazing. It's like a giant chandelier essentially of like tubes and stuff. It's so cool. I really want to look into the science of how they get it done. And uh, in addition to quantum computing or quantum chips and stuff, I think the other area of cool importance of like uh, chip development is in what's called neuromorphic chips. And so these are chips that were that people are designing to actually be more replicative of how the brain works and how AI works. And so basically be more um, prone to doing these computations faster and low power like the brain works. I think that's really interesting that we're developing these circuits now to compute like the brain computes. There's so many similarities. Like, have, have you ever seen the picture where they like zoom out on the farthest level of the universe and then they compare that to the brain and it's like almost the same exact structure? I don't think I've seen it before. No, it's, but it's pretty fucking crazy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is really uh, interesting just how these, how the, I guess this quantum theory applies to things on like a whole galactic scale, but also on such a small scale as well. Yeah, I guess that makes sense too, because if you believe in, I've been spending the last two Saturdays watching UFO documentaries <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> regardless if UFOs are real or not, there's obviously something, even the Pentagon released it where there's ships flying that are defying our own, our known laws of, of gravity and physics that maybe it's something on a quantum level that was maybe isolated and then they built their technology around it or even just a completely different field in, in general, that we can't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Rocket <laughs> repulsion in general is such a... That, that mathematics is, is beyond me. I don't, <laughs> don't want to mess with rocket repulsion and stuff. <laughs> so when they say um, he's smart like a rocket scientist, they really mean it? Yeah, that <laughs> stuff is no joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I don't know enough about the math to know how it stands up to mine if it's if it is as difficult or if it's more difficult, but I would, I would assume that it is. <laughs> yeah. It's on a little bit more of a macro scale and you have like no, um, no room to, to fuck up in, in short, because if you have one small mathematics off, the whole thing can blow up. <laughs> right. And it's all just about like studying, you know, the curves of how, okay, so the, the wind is hitting this curve in a certain way. Then how does the curve move? How does the wind move? And all these like jet streams, no, too many <laughs> small parts of that. Like I want to go, I just want to go on the micro scale and yeah. understand electricity. Yeah, I just want to <laughs> put lightning into people's brains. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do want to go back to um, the academic sky, yeah. side of your PhD. And so we were saying that basically you have you have a professor who oversees, but in order to grade the dissertation, it's like they kind of just like pull it together between a few of them because they might not all understand the specialization. Yeah. And then after you do receive a pass, what's the next step after that usually with a uh, PhD student for electrical engineering? Uh, so once you receive the pass on your dissertation, then you're basically done. Mm-hmm. That's like kind of the last step that um, they say, okay, you've done the research, you've finished the class. Sometimes you'll have an extra exam to take, but I think generally speaking, the dissertation is the last step in the process. So yeah, that'll be kind of like... Um, I think next semester is my last semester of coursework and I have to pass and or take and pass my qualifying exam. And once I passed the exam, I advanced on to being a PhD candidate instead of a PhD student. 
And then after that, it's just research. And I work on my research until I finish my dissertation. And then they tell me I can go. Yes, and I could see more um, cynical tweets yeah. through this whole entire process. Honestly, <laughs> I think they'll probably actually let up after next semester <laughs> because once I'm out of the coursework, I think things will be uh, magnitudes more enjoyable. Why? Why do you? Why do you think it is that a lot of PhD students, I guess, more so? Because you said it was, you saw it common between other PhD students. So why? Why do you think there is such just like? I mean, obviously, you guys want to get your degree, but it's it's like a sarcastic, cynical view on it because of is it just like overloaded management of work or is it just maybe that since everyone is so specialized, there's no one governance um, per student. So there's a lot of like mismanagement. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of different uh, aspects that go into it. I would say the biggest one is just that. um PhD getting a PhD is arguably the hardest thing I'll ever do. Like I'll probably do research that is technically more rigorous or more difficult down the line, but just like the sheer amount of requirements and like stuff that you need to do to get a PhD is really a lot. And it can like, it could get to people. It's similar to like, um, remember how after pledging, they always told us like pledging is the worst thing you'll never <laughs> want to do again because yeah. like it was fun, but like how much we hated it. It's like that but times a thousand. It's just like, okay, I really love what I'm doing and I love the research that I'm doing, but it is so difficult. Like, A, there's a topic that you love that you want to do research on, which already takes up all the time in the world. Then there's your coursework. So like sometimes three classes a semester. There's all the stuff like requirements that you have to do, like, um, you know, teaching assistants, things like that, helping out with other research projects. There's... Um, the fact that grad students are so like underpaid in this country that they're basically uh, majority of grad students are under the poverty line. I would say, uh, what else in my experience, a lot of the difficulties that have come with like grad school and stuff have honestly come from the standpoint of like administrative or bureaucratic stuff that were even completely like separate from the education. Like there's been instances where, uh, I had like a, I wasn't getting my degree like a month after I graduated from my master's or whatever. And I was like trying to figure out why. And it's because there was a form somewhere that was held up that someone didn't sign. So I had to like call people and like make sure that was signed. And it's just stuff like that every step of the way. And so it's like one of those things where you really put yourself under like a lot of mental stress and stuff to pursue this one thing that you're so incredibly passionate about. And it's kind of like, and, I, and I'm sure in a lot of institutions, uh, I can't say I've necessarily felt this on my own end, but I hear from a lot of institutions that the professors treat it almost like, like hazing to an extent, where they know you're going to go through this stuff and it's like a rite of passage in a way, that you have to go through all of the bullshit to get to the PhD at the end, and that even if all the bullshit is completely like independent of your research or anything else that you would ever do in the future, you still need to do it. Yeah. Um, one of the guys I always talk about that I really like is Eric Weinstein, and he's been pretty vocal about um, universities and kind of the bureaucratic cartel and kind of like how they're just like in it for themselves. And one of the um, big um, crit critiques that he has is he blames tenure um, for the professors where once they hit like whatever it is, 10 years, and then they get their um, pension that they kind of just like, they don't focus on the students anymore. They're just focused on just getting those years down and getting, getting their money essentially. Yeah. There's definitely an element of that. Um, it's not necessarily true for every professor. Like my PI, for example, is like the nicest individual you'll ever meet and will like break his back to help you understand a math problem. It's insane, but that's definitely not consistent across the board. And I've had professors that, you know, it was very clear that they, you know, didn't want anything less than to be there teaching people mm -hmm. and it's like okay why are you in academia at that point because I know plenty of people who like teaching I like teaching I would love to be able to teach some of these courses and do it in a way that really like resonates with students and really teaches them interesting stuff because that's you know what I've found is so discouraging about a lot of education is that it teaches these interesting subjects in such a unapproachable and boring way that even if you're passionate about it, you can be sit through the subject and going, oh, what is this? I don't want to hear any of this. And it's, it's an issue because there's such cool stuff out there and you should be passionate about what you're teaching. So do you think um, the, mo the education model 
on a superior level, like PhD level and masters is maybe broken and it's, or not broken. Like it's just antiqued just as like we've seen now with coronavirus, how like maybe business meetings in person are antiqued or a lot of these, like we're starting to learn that physical dollars is antiqued and everything's going digital and um, online education is becoming more popular. Do you think the model for higher learning may be antiqued a little bit? Um, to an extent, yes, but I don't think it's necessarily from the actual educational standpoint so much as it is from just like the bureaucratic surrounding it. I think from the educational standpoint, it's that there are too many people with antiquated views in these positions and that if you just get people who are really passionate about what they're doing, then, and you know, passionate about teaching, then you end up with much better results. Like, I mean, I've, I've taken classes in a subject matter that I've already like studied before and known and not done well just because I like didn't enjoy the way that the class is being presented and just didn't have like the motivation to put the effort into a class that like wasn't putting it back, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, and that, that comes back to like tenured once, once some of these professors, not all of them, obviously it's not one fit all, but once they get past their, their benchmark that they need, they just lose motivation towards yeah. it. Yeah. And he also too, he brought up an interesting point and I know this doesn't apply to all universities, but he said that in the the nineties, the um, the presidents of the universities were in their fifties, and in today's age, the average age of a president uh, for their universities in the seventies. So it's showing that it's like almost the same people, or it's just like one off friends that are running the universities. Yeah, or at least the same generation. And um, I don't know how much of that is a statement on the, I guess, like state of universities, so much as it is the state of employment in general, and that just people are retiring at a much later age, if at all. And that, um, but yeah, I can see that it does need to be like more. Uh, we do need a younger crowd to start coming in, or at least people with younger mindset coming in because, uh, you know, like Bernie Sanders, for example, he wasn't exactly a young person, but he had that kind of like younger mindset where, well, okay, we need to start being progressive. We need to start making changes and stuff that we can't keep doing things the same way we've, we've been doing it. And I think we need that in academia as well. I, I think so too as well. Yeah. And so um, when, once you do pass, what's, what's your next step? Do, would you like to, you said that you were very enthused in teaching. Would you go that route? Or I guess we could just say in general, when someone gets their PhD, is there usually jobs lined up or do you have to go out and search for it again? So I guess it really depends on the field, I would say, because um, like I think, and I, well, it depends a little bit on the field and a little bit on your credentials and who you, the content, the connections you made in grad school. Like, for example, my PI is pretty well connected to like some UC schools where if I graduate and pass and, you know, have enough publications under my belt, it'll be pretty easy for me to get some interviews at some like pretty decent schools to at least be like an assistant professor or whatever the entry position is. But that's not always the case for a lot of, uh, for a lot of people whether it's because they don't have the connections or for some fields, the academic job market just isn't great. Like, um, I think I'm pretty sure philosophy is a pretty big one where if you don't get a job in academia after getting your philosophy PhD and you're not like a writer or something, then you're probably going to be doing something that isn't related to philosophy. And, uh, whereas me, because engineering and electrical engineering is kind of in everything, I can I can always do something that's at least relative to what I specialize in, maybe not necessarily like neuroscience oriented, but you know, there's always gonna be a need for robotics engineers. There's always gonna there's always gonna need for, be a need for engineers in general. And so I'll be set in that regard. But what I wanna do is kind of up in the air still. I definitely like do wanna do more research and do want to um I guess my like st- my uh staple so to speak or like what's what do they call it in Westworld the like uh the like key memory or whatever oh your um it's like your backstory but yeah like your cornerstone yeah cornerstone yeah Yeah. yeah. and so I guess like my cornerstone is that I want to help people and animals in the long run that's it so whatever way my research takes me to doing that whether it's continuing to develop a technology for people in some regard I want to keep doing that because that's kind of really what uh makes me feel fulfilled in my work. And so I guess that either leads me to keep doing research and, you know, develop stuff that's more applicable and usable. Or my other uh, thought is that I've always had this dream of um, 
and maybe I, I could probably do this in coordination while doing some type of research as well, but I have a dream of operating a rescue sanctuary for senior animals. And so basically just like getting a large plot of land or whatever and building a sanctuary that because of all of my background in automations engineering, I could automate all the things like cleaning, feeding, things like that. And so anytime we have like volunteers and stuff, we can really maximize the amount of time people spend with the animals instead of doing all of the dirty work and just really give, you know, the issue is that a lot of these senior dogs and cats and stuff in shelters is that nobody wants to adopt them because who, because people, the fact of the matter is don't want to adopt a dog that's going to die in a couple of years. But that doesn't make them any less special and they do need a place to live and enjoy the last few years of their lives. And so I think it'd be great to build a place that does that for them. Smart sanctuary. I like that. I didn't, I've never even heard of that concept before. Is that, is that something you came up with or did you, was there something that you kind of um, are, I wouldn't say mimicking, but you just kind of translate that you saw on the internet, maybe. Uh, it was something I came up with, and I've seen since that. I guess there's this, uh, like, sanctuary in, I think it's, like, Tennessee. And they do the same thing. None of it's, like, automated, but they do. They have a sanctuary where they, uh, especially directed towards senior dogs who aren't going to, who are less likely to be adopted. And so um, the idea is just to take, take kind of that and then just kind of, like, build it up and automate things so they can really kind of run at like high efficiency and maximize the amount of care that we uh, dedicate to animals. It's very genuine. Yeah. I like animals a lot. <laughs> yeah. You, you actually are um, an adopter of dog too. Yeah. And I just, um, I fostered a cat for a while. Did I tell you about that? The cat uh, walked into I, my I, house. I saw a post about it, but <laughs> I haven't talked to you about it. Yeah. Uh, I was just, it was like in the middle of the night and uh, I heard this meowing sounded like it was inside my house what the hell is that and so i go and open the front door and a cat just walks right into my house and decided that it was its house <laughs> and so i like asked around the neighborhood posted online all this stuff and the general consensus was that uh it was just a cat that um people had seen like roaming around the neighborhood and would like just go from house to house that whatever would feed it and that if it walked into my house and wanted to stay there, then it was my cat. They just like keep it. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, um, I couldn't keep it because uh, it was I was having too many difficulties introducing her with my dog, uh, and so because of all the stuff that I had going on with school and stuff, I found it probably better for the cat to rehome it and find it a loving home. So I did that. But, yeah, it was a nice little cat. I like that. I like the. Uh, hold on, I want to dive a little bit more into the, the smart sanctuary though. Yeah, so good. so you'd be able to autonomy the sanitation and maybe the the cleaning behind it or is it just more of just building a comfortable environment for them so um a lot of different things the idea would be like uh around their collar they would have like an rfid type chip or whatever you know that would be programmed with their identity and so they'd each have their own kennel so to speak and the kennel would you know essentially open up for them and them only and be able to lock behind them so that they have their own area of privacy that they can access without someone having to open and close it for them whenever need be. Same thing with feeding. Like instead of having someone go by and feed all of the bowls everywhere, set up like a pipeline system that can just put the, or even just like fill up a tank in each person or in each uh, animal's kennel and then just have it fill periodically and things like that. And so just really trying to reduce the amount of man hours that are needed to upkeep the place. And uh, because one of the things that they show in shelters is that if you have more one-on-one -on -one time with people with animals versus just cleaning the stuff, the animals are in, are much happier and much more adoptable in that sense because they have a generally better um, disposition that makes them you know, more uh, approachable. Are you going to call it a uh, neuro clean too? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. That's his uh, Twitter handle. That's why I had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing about that, I was actually, so um, I was talking with uh, this guy on Twitter, Andrew J. Keller. He's one of the co-founders of Neurosity. They're a um, BCI company based out of New York. They're, I believe, taking pre-orders for their headset that comes out in December. Really awesome product. If you want to look into it, they um, their whole thing is that they specialize in tracking your level of focus or calm while you're working and so it can give you like a report of like okay so while you're working this is how focused you were this is where you like drop focus and like what you can do and it's like the goal is to help you you know be better at being productive and so I've been talking to this guy like on and off for a few months now and then by chance we ended up uh in the same like um conference call like a few weeks ago talk for this like neurotech x organization and we were talking for a while and 
the whole time I realized that he didn't know who I was. Like we were having a video chat and I realized he had no idea who I was because it had my name on there and my Twitter handle doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I had to uh, tweet at him afterwards like, hey, that was me that's by yeah. the way. <laughs> yeah. That's, so. that's fucking funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But. It's funny. He has a uh, neuro clean because when, when we were in college, uh, he was our uh, college fraternity DJ and he, he, he went by Mr. Clean. And then once the, once he got his degree, he changed it to NeuroClean. Yeah. And it's mm-hmm. kind of just stuck. We'll be Dr. Clean once I finish my PhD. That's what I can't wait for. <laughs> <laughs> clean with a K, though, because I didn't have the energy to look up if Clean with a C was copyrighted. I'm sure <laughs> sure Mr. Clean with a C was copyrighted. It's copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, I do really like the um, Smart Sanctuary. Um if you heard it here, this is IP already, so <laughs> you're not, you're not well, allowed. Oh uh, no, that's the thing. Actually, they are allowed. So one of the things is that uh, you know part of the idea behind it is that I want to, or behind everything that I do is that I want it to be. Um, how do I just? How you want do it I to be like open source. Yeah, easily distributable. Like the same thing with these technologies that I'm working on for nonverbal disabilities. It's all going to be open source stuff, and like, so if anyone wants to build on top of it, they're welcome to. And the same thing with the smart sanctuary is that once I build things or program things like how to automate the locking or whatever the doors, reading the RFID chips, this is all stuff that I'm going to open source and put online because the idea is there should be more of these. So, and, lot, so like a GitHub. Yeah, and like. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll do things like part of the thing to help me fund my own development is that I can like, um, you know, if people instead don't want to build it themselves, like, okay, how do I get like the door or whatever, I can build it and sell it to them or whatever and things like that. And, or other types of methods like a Patreon or whatever, find some way to raise money. But the idea is that it should be usable for everyone. And even if like, let's say you have, let's say you're not even running a sanctuary, but you just happen to have like, you know, four or five dogs and you have a bunch of time and a little bit of money on your hands and you want to, you know, automate all that stuff as well, should be able to do it. There is a huge migration over to open uh, source technologies. And even Microsoft, this is like a few days ago, they came out and said that they were wrong yeah. on open source yeah. technologies and that they're going to put a boatload of money into funding different projects. That's, yeah, that's awesome. And uh, that's really great because Microsoft has been so anti open source for a while now that it, uh, it it's really nice because the the open source community is nothing but for the benefit of the people is that putting these advanced tools into the hands of anyone. I think it's a good PR move too because um, how we're seeing what's happened with this economic pandemic and companies not protecting their employees and some are that I think our generation more specifically is looking to find an employer who doesn't it's not necessarily just pay. Everyone wants to get paid, but you want to have some sort of uh, responsibility to their employees and the mission for whatever this statement is. Right. I would, mu- I mean, that's kind of like the crux of many people in academia is that, or at least engineering, for example, uh, if I work in academia for the rest of my life, I'm likely going to be taking a pay cut to do that, to, you know, help people instead of work for some corporate entity or whatever, which I'm completely fine with. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's I like you're saying, a lot of us value working for someone that you know we can go to sleep at night comfortably than an extra paycheck yeah it's, it's well put um and there's a there's a huge disparity between us and the baby boomers that we see and i think that that ideal is just only getting infringed upon and getting larger by the day oh yeah because yeah. Of what's going on <laughs> oh yeah and especially because we see how blatantly a lot of these companies are pushing that envelope that it's just it becomes more and more difficult to stand by and you know let it happen mm-hmm. so it's well put and um, there was a, there is another topic I did want to talk about that we yeah. haven't got to is something that I saw you posted um, a few weeks ago that yeah. you had just started. Um, what was it called? Transcranial magnetic stimulation. Yes. So um, I was supposed to start it a couple of weeks ago. I ended up starting it just starting it on Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday I think. And so this is really cool. It's a n- Newer revolutionary treatment for a variety of mental health disorders. Um, I'm going through it specifically for major depressive disorder. And uh, so specifically treatment-resistant major depressive disorder. I've and taken, this is clinically diagnosed? Yeah. Okay. I've taken, um, I've taken a few different antidepressants and other treatments and stuff. And so far, nothing's really taken. And so what transcranial magnetic stimulation does is they take a magnetic coil and put it up to the regions of your brain associated with depression 
and send a magnetic pulse at like a certain frequency, a certain amount of times per second to your brain to stimulate those regions of the brain and reconnect certain neurons and like allow them to function like they used to. And um, it's shown amazing results in like clinical research. So there's a few different ways that it's done, but I think the a recent study I think had the best result percentage I've seen so far out of Stanford. It was called the Stanford Saint study. They found that if you increase the dosage, so to speak, so give people more pulses over a shorter period of time, they ended up with a 95% remission rate. Wow. So it was like, I think they had 24 subjects and 22 people prior to the treatment had suicidal ideation. 21 people afterwards, no more. Wow. Yeah. So, and this is just, that's just from re essentially rewiring the brain. Yeah. It's as, as, uh, the psychiatrist that I saw, um, Dr. Bist, he said it's essentially resetting the brain and it makes sense. You know, uh, it, that if I guess like a lot of the depression is that there are certain neurons that aren't really firing. So if you can re-stimulate them to fire, then it should start to, uh, pull away. And I have started to see, see results pretty significant over the last, you know, four days I've been doing it. Um, I have seen like a pretty dramatic increase in the, in my line of thinking, you know, positivity, my, my ability to kind of like pull myself out of anxious states or like negative periods or whatever. Uh, and that's only after four days of the treatment oh, wow. and it's going to last six weeks. So it's six weeks. Ha and you ha have you felt any after effects from it? Anything negative or just, just positive so yeah. far? Yeah. And, and that's the thing is like, it's so one of the things about the treatment is that there aren't negative effects. There is an extremely mild chance that uh, you could have a seizure, but I believe it is your likelihood for a seizure is increased about the same amount that it is with antidepressants. So it's not even like different from that regard, but like it's a treatment where if it doesn't work, then it just doesn't work. And like, all right, you're back to wherever you were before, but like no negative effects. Whereas I took an antidepressant that uh, like so thoroughly messed up my mind, like my, my thinking process. I literally almost failed out of school while on it. And uh, then I had to go through a two month period, two month withdrawal period, trying to wean myself off of the medication where it would uh, invoke these things called brain zaps, where um, I believe the research on them right now is that they're essentially like literal micro seizures in a way. But for two months, essentially, I would just periodically throughout the day have this feeling of like an electrical sensation in my brain. And then like my face would go numb for a second and like my vision would take a second to catch up. And then towards the end of it, that was happening like a few times per minute. Scary. Yeah, it was awful. And so after that, I was just kind of like, I'm super hesitant to take antidepressants at all because like, and I know that doing my research now, I see that that medication in particular was kind of like a uh, outlier and that more people tend to have reported those results than with others. And so... I guess like I should take some solace in that, but still it kind of turned me off the whole medical route for a while. And that's kind of where I resulted with TMS is that it doesn't have any negative effects if it doesn't work, but the results show that it's very promising and much at a much higher remission rate than other medicate than other treatments. And how, why don't more people go down this, this route? Is it because it's such a new treatment or do you think that it's just like, is it first, is it covered by um, medical insurance? So th that's kind of the reason right now is that, and this is why I hate insurance companies. That's, so that's much, kind of that. thought. It's like pharma has something to do with it. Yeah. And that not even, I mean, I'm sure pharma has something to do with it, but even just that the insurance companies are so antiquated and archaic, they just don't even know about it. It's still for them to depression, the go-to is medication and stuff. And what my doc my doctor was telling me, he believes that this should be the first line of treatment because of, you know, it works better and doesn't have any negative consequences. It's just that the like the insurance needs to see it. More research needs to come out and they just need to see that this is having better results. Cause like it, you know, the insurance, the fact of the matter is they don't understand what the hell or at least in my experience, they don't understand what the hell this is. And it took like two or three weeks for them to like actually authorize the treatment for me. Despite the doctor being under in my in work providers, because it's like such a different treatment, they were like, uh, okay, well, we don't know if we're actually going to authorize this yet. And 
that's kind of like the issue is that so it's it's crazy it's, this is the treatment that is so effective for such a problem that plagues so many people and it's just barriers for tons for tons yeah and it takes like and the thing is like when I was li- when I was thinking when I was hearing about it, I'm thinking oh I have to do this every day for six weeks like that's going to be such an like hindrance on my life like how am I gonna it, it takes 15 minutes I like wake up in the morning drive over there do it and I'm back like by the time like for breakfast <laughs> wow yeah yeah and just show that like you're allowed to to drive right after shows that it's not expected to have any sort of uh, impact right after right yeah. after yeah it's just you sit there they watch whatever they have on their tv for oh so you're you're awake too eyes oh, yeah. open yeah that's pretty cool have yeah. you been a had since you have obviously you're getting a phd in this sort of field um are you able to get any readings from them or understand um the sheet that they give you so they don't um i guess they don't take readings themselves it's more of just like uh they do a self-assessment so you just tell them like how your symptoms are feeling but um now that i'm am feeling a little bit better and able to like get more stuff done i am going to start taking scans of my own brain before and after the treatments to see how it affects it over time uh i wish i had started it when i started the treatment but um as i said on twitter one of the things about major depressive disorder is that sometimes when you really want to do something you just can't <laughs> is it considered ethical if you're studying yourself <laughs> uh, <laughs> i mean I, I think i think the irb might have something to say about it if i try to publish it but <laughs> i mean i could study myself all i want <laughs> that's that's funny it's I don't, it literally comes full circle you know actually i actually i don't know i think it might be one of those situations where like it's like all right if you're doing it on yourself like you're your own agency, so... Yeah, I, ca- I can't name <laughs> a specific study, but I know there are studies where the scientist um, or researcher essentially uses himself as the test dummy or the yeah. operator. Yeah, I think, like, the the biggest ethic or the biggest consideration when it comes to research ethics is making sure that, okay, so you're only doing... You only have one person that's a small sample size. Uh, if the person receiving the treatment is also the person publishing the research, <laughs> there might be kind of some type of bias there, but also maybe not depending on uh, what the context of it is. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things to consider that regard, but it would be nice if I could publish my own research. I probably should have definitely started before <laughs> <laughs> if I wanted to do that. It's an interesting thought, though. Yeah. And this um, this treatment, is it just to treat depression or could it be for a few... Um, different uh, medical imbalances in the brain uh so i believe it is also treated for um used for ocd uh anxiety disorders and i think adhd as well and maybe maybe some other ones but i know that there is a lot more research for other um mental disabilities as well uh, then i know a- adhd i think is the most common uh, mental disorder within yeah. uh, younger the younger generation disorder, not disability that's disability right. my bad yeah, no, no, disorder is right <laughs> or disorder i think I think disability is the in, the incorrect term. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, f- I forget. I just know, um, like one of my family members, my mom's been plagued by that for a while. And when when they get when they have these mental disorders, you get put on um, social security disability is what they call it. Oh, so okay. that's kind of yeah, where yeah, I was. Yeah, that that, that's where I was getting that term okay. from. But I guess in, in a more PC culture, I think disorder <laughs> sounds a little maybe, bit better. Yeah, maybe maybe <laughs> they're maybe both are fine i don't know entirely <laughs> again if it's coming from the government it's probably antique terminology <laughs> yeah yeah that's true <laughs> well, yeah um i mean i i do also actually suffer from adhd as well and it is a um and you know there's a lot of uh thought that goes into it about it's like a chicken or the egg situation you know what comes first and what begets the other because obviously if you're having a lot of troubles focusing in areas where it matters that's going to affect your happiness but also, if you're depressed, your happiness affects your ability to focus. And so, like, <laughs> it's hard to figure. There's a comorbidity aspect. They have to figure out which one to treat. And Interesting. So do you, do you know or can you pinpoint a time where you felt depression or the ADHD come in? Um, yeah, so the, honestly, the ADHD feels like something that's been kind of prevalent for a good portion of my life. And um, I feel this way because... I remember that there was a period of time where I was just trying to convince myself that I didn't have it and that like it was just made up and that I, you know, I could really just work myself around this or whatever. And that's, that wasn't the case, but to prove that I'd set out like to look up all this research to figure out like what the symptoms are and like, um, 
stories from people who have had it and dealt with it for a long time. And that really just solidified that I do have it because it like really a lot of it rang true. And one of the things that rang so true about it was this memory of growing up where I was never able to focus in school. I never uh, like was on time with my homework. I barely ever remembered that I even had homework. And I just got by because I always had kind of a natural aptitude for math. And so everyone assumed that because I was doing good in school meant that I was working really hard and like, you know, focusing and doing and like trying really hard. But that wasn't the case. I is just, um, you know, not not to sound cocky or anything, but it was kind of like a natural aptitude. And it came back to like bite me because later on I was trying to like focus so much and it just wasn't working out. And I was just like convinced so much that it was just something that was, you know, wrong with me and that like, you know, I was just being lazy or whatever that I didn't really ever try to like try to pay any attention as it might be an attention disorder until I started reading more and more experiences about how, you know, ADHD is a malfunctioning of like the executive part of the brain essentially. And a lot of the ways that it manifests itself, I started to realize were actually true in a lot of the things that I've done. Whereas depression, I would say my first experience with it probably came around like 2014, 20, yeah, about 2014. Um, And that's when... I started to like battle with that a lot. And so for that reason, I think the ADHD was first, but I also don't know if that the depression was necessarily brought on by the ADHD or if it was just kind of also there. Or it could have come maybe just from the overload of schoolwork. I think yeah. uh, it's probably prominent within the higher education. Um, system. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mental health is um like a very, uh, prominent topic in the like academic world because a lot of grad students do have mental health issues and I mean the insurance that we get isn't so great and so <laughs> it's hard to treat those issues. Did you have um, any let's say like natural remedies to help with your depression when the medication wasn't working? Um, I know I know people um who suffer from depression, maybe they'll watch like the same show all the time, or maybe they li- listen to music or maybe they like cook. Yeah. I would say music is probably one of the biggest things that's helped out a lot is that, um, even with ADHD as well is that I find that, uh, listening to good music or something that really like either speaks with me or something that's like, um, I've been a fan of for a long time kind of like brings me out of it because it, uh, I mean, I'm sure, you know, music kind of speaks to you on a deeper level than Mm. anything else does. I've always felt that way about music, that it's kind of like, um, if there's any, like, uh, I don't want to say supernatural, but like virtually supernatural type forces in the world, I think music is one of them because it's like so powerful in the way that it affects people. And we've even, we even see there's like research on how music affects different people with like neurological disabilities, like Alzheimer's, for example, they show, um, like there's this video, uh, I don't remember what it's called, but there's this documentary where this person, I think with, I think it was with Alzheimer's, generally non-communicative, wouldn't hold the conversation, wouldn't respond or anything. They played him this jazz song from when he was a young boy and he loved it. And then immediately afterwards was able to hold a full conversation and like, you know, remember time things from when he was that young too, when you wouldn't really re- be able to remember things in general. And it's just amazing the way that like, it speaks to us in that sense. It's it's nostalgia, and yeah. I, I kind of have a similar experience with that too. When uh, when I quit drinking two years ago, um, throughout I guess from the time that I started drinking, and for about that ten years, I'd always listen to electronic music predominantly. But once I quit drinking, um, I found myself listening to like classic rock and alternative rock, which is what I had listened to in high school and uh, when I was younger. And to this day, I still listen to it a lot, but I think it, I felt myself turning more to that. And like, I completely turned off electronic music for probably about six months. And, um, it just like helped me associate, um, my mind with like simpler times to yeah. before the, the chaos ensued and everything. And that was up attributed to just like music from when I was younger. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, it like, uh, it almost brings up the idea of um, establishing, like, I guess, we're reestablishing neural pathways from when you were younger and having more of, like, a, I guess, like, a childlike sense of wonder in a way and more appreciative mm-hmm. of things and be able to appreciate the beauty of things better. And, uh, you know, it makes sense where 
it kind of brings to mind the things, um, there was some research a few years ago about the effects that LSD has on the brain, where they find that um, LSD essentially reestablishes some neural connections that were present when you were younger or children. That's kind of what creates these different perceptions of what's going on around you. And it's just interesting how like closely that seems to relate to other things where it's like, all right, bringing back this childlike sense of wonder essentially makes you a happier person because it allows you to like appreciate things better and appreciate the beauty in the world and, you know, like, I guess, desire things more in a way. It's interesting. Yeah, it's before before life has kind of just ripped you apart a little bit more, more or less. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it does do that. But it's, it's interesting um, because you see a huge combination of LSD and music festivals and the um the feeling that people get with it i know i mean granted i know a lot of people overdo it in a sense but that was start the start of the the free your mind movement like what yeah. stock in 69 was was music and lsd and i think music kind of changed at that point yeah from what talk moving on yeah i think people um maybe give like uh psychedelics a little bit too much credit on their ability to heal the mind because like I see a lot of information, like a lot of information coming out about um, how the FDA is approving and like, you know, psilocybin, the active ingredient in mushrooms is used for psychotherapeutic trials. And it's really, really effective for treating depression and for PTSD and things like that. And so a lot of people hear that and they think, oh, okay, I can go take some mushrooms and, you know, just think <laughs> for a little while. And then, you know, it's good for the mind. and It'll be, you know, I'll be all done and happy like that. They don't read the details and understand that what like is what's going on and how this is done is it's in a controlled setting. It's just that there's psychotherapeutic trials. So it's not just taking some mushrooms and going to the forest with your friends and having a good time. It's sitting there with a therapist who's going to have you recount some really difficult times in your past. And it's not going to be enjoyable, but it's necessary. And like, you know, it's something that is meant to really like have you reevaluate these different traumatic experiences in your life. But overall, it's not like a pleasant experience in the moment, I imagine. And that's what people are kind of like misconstruing is that these <laughs> things, yeah, they do have some power, or at least that's what the research is starting to show, but it's in the right settings. You can't just be like, okay, this works in this setting. I'm going to take it in a completely different setting with a different context and expect the same results. It's not going to happen because you can just as easily really mess with your mind without like the proper setting. Yeah, I've actually just from personal experience being with people, I've seen it go the complete opposite and scar people and actually turn people off from just their current lifestyle altogether and completely 180 their life. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not something that like, I think people really take this research and think, Oh, like I can, this is magic. Then it's like, no, 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 no. It's there's science behind it and it needs to be done in coordination with the science. Yeah. There's, I think there's like three cities in America too that have decriminalized um, psilocybin yeah. um, as far as holding it. I know it was uh, Colorado or Denver, <laughs> Oakland. And I think there was somewhere in Chicago or Chicago area as well. And it's becoming more prevalent too. I don't know if you watch the show billions. It's on uh, mm -hmm. Showtime. It's basically about a hedge fund guy, fictional character, but in episode two, they referred it was basically about a shaman who's opening up a business and they called it psychoceuticals. And it was um, a business that was built on psilocybin and uh, ayahuasca um, me medicinal uses. But you see these two um, hedge fund guys trying to like battle to get his signature on the dotted line. But as you see this, like there's been a lot more focus on this industry as oh, a yeah. whole and just like the complete um, different outlook on um on those kind of drugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's definitely some um, promising results behind them. And unfortunately, you know, they have people on one side who are going to stop at anything to make sure that research never sees the light of the day. And then you're going to have the other people who completely, you know, misconstrue what the research means and misuse it. It's mostly been used for PTSD, I believe, is what I've seen the yeah, biggest treatment disorder right. for. Yeah, I think it's... um. It's either psilocybin or LSD that was used also for um, treating, coming to terms with having a uh, terminal illness. And so, like, you know, the depression associated with, you know, that you're inevitably going to pass away. How do you deal with that? And I think it was, I think it might have been psilocybin as well, because I think it was a lot of the same things that have to do with PTSD. But, yeah, it was really interesting. 
I think too that people get it twisted be- of its relevance in pop culture, where you see people like Steve Jobs in his um, autobiography attributes um, a lot of his success to um, LSD trips and coming up with these crazy ideas. So I think a lot of people try to mimic that, and a lot of you don't realize the things that Steve Jobs had done prior to that. <laughs> right, it's like to be able to put him in that position. Yeah, you got to be Steve Jobs to have a <laughs> Steve Jobs type revelation. Like the mushrooms, <laughs> not the, the mushrooms weren't the key there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the pre- so you do see it. It's interesting that it is becoming more relevant in pop culture. But again, it's just like with with marijuana. The marijuana at dispensaries is completely different potency than the ones that are on the street. Oh yeah, and people are beginning to find out from all these edible um, stories that I read where they take a lot more um, edibles from dispensary than they had taken from their own bakings. And yeah. they have to go to the hospital because they're having a complete like mental relapse. Yeah, that, that does happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know a few a uh, few friends who've taken um, medical uh, marijuana brownies on a flight and then com- completely quit smoking for like a month. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like so torn from it. <laughs> wow, just like yeah, hyperventilating, cold oh, sweat. Yeah, the plane <laughs> is not the place to do that either. Yeah, yeah so I think. Uh, as Americans and just people in general, we need to understand the responsibility that comes behind harnessing these different powers, oh, yeah. which is why people are turned off by it. But then, you know, our, our generation, the younger generation has gone through a lot of these experiences um, personally. So there's just a complete different mindset and outlook on it. Right. And it doesn't help that we were taught our whole growing up that this stuff would literally kill us if we took it once. <laughs> and like the, you know, the type of world shattering illusion that that, that provoked when you find out none of that is true yeah <laughs> it's interesting it makes me wonder what other kind of things are out there yeah i mean one of the th- one of the things that you uh, really realize in grad school and that you know kind of line with that is that no one really knows anything like everyone just making stuff up and a lot of the stuff that we were taught when we were younger is just awful like just so not true like why do we drink milk <laughs> <laughs> the different social constructions yeah it's just like we were taught so many things that would be like arbitrary things that would be good for us just because of someone paid to have it said in an advertisement because it helped fund their product or get their product sold. The mar- sold. the marketing behind everything is insane and the, the amount of money behind it. Yeah. <laughs> the social constructions. It's, um, it's something that I realized too, uh, ironically off of a mushroom experience myself where the first time I ever did mushrooms is me and one of my good friends. We were walking around um, my street that I grew up on and we were standing, it was probably like midnight and we were just standing in front of this house and we looked through the window and we saw this just like family in there. And um, yeah, this is going to be a very, it's going to be a very, <laughs> it's going to be a very morbid comment, but oh, I can guarantee you nothing happened. But <laughs> it's, it's, it, it plays into the point though, is like we, we like stood there and, you know, we're 18 and we just looked at each other and we're just like, wow. Like, we, we could go in there and, like, rob this family <laughs> and nothing, nobody would ever figure anything out. But it kind of, like, set this idea that a lot of the social constructions that are created, like the law and what what the media says and everything, like, yes, it is morally wrong, obviously, and those morals were created off of um, the Ten Commandments, which could be a whole different topic of social constructions, but it made us realize that the world wasn't really as structured as people say it out to be and that it's just word of mouth. Nothing's like complete. There, so it's interesting. That actually sounds a lot like, uh, are you familiar with the concept of the call of the void? No. It's, um, I forget what the French, it's like lapel la do something um, in French. But the idea is that it's that thought that, have you ever, have you gone to the Grand Canyon or like stood mm-hmm. at a high building and you're standing at the edge and you think, I could just jump right now. Like this, all it takes is just one opportunity through my that's what the call of the void is that that voice that everyone gets to like you know it seems like an intrusive voice that like oh i shouldn't be having this thought but yeah. it's literally just like something that I, it's weird just like i could do this really fucked up thing right now and it all it takes is one second one second <laughs> yeah. yeah that's interesting i didn't know that there was a specific terminology yeah. on it but i know uh another void um act that people talk about all the time is like grabbing a police officer's gun while it's strapped to their hip yeah, like yeah. you have that like urge to do it but you know it's obviously not a right thing to do right right and it's gonna end really bad <laughs> for you <laughs> yeah or like uh um you know like i used to work at a starbucks and like you'd open up the register to do all the cash like 
I could just take all this cash and run right now. <laughs> Wouldn't get very far. <laughs> I could do it. <laughs> it's interesting. I guess that's a good representation of free will, though. Yeah. Like, that thought even just coming in. Yeah. <laughs> but you, then you know, like, okay, I could do that because I had the free will to. And then a lot of other people have a free will to do a lot of other things to me. <laughs> yeah, it goes to, um, I'm a big philosophy buff, even though I didn't study. I, I wanted to, but I, I knew at a young age that it wouldn't lead somewhere mm -hmm. um, that I could study on my own. But I listen to a lot of like philosophy podcasts and I've read like a few as well. And one common thing that I've always noticed is a lot of the older philosophers, Aristotle, Socrates, a lot of these, they always say they the most popular or um, the best philosopher is Moses. And because Moses created the Ten Commandments because he realized that society needed something to um, kind of, they needed these rules, but he knew that they wouldn't believe him if he just came down and made these rules up. So he used um, a higher being and these like crazy story that nobody else could ever prove. And so he came down with these with these Ten Commandments kind of as like a society for rules or rules for society to follow. That's really interesting. I've never heard that uh, interpretation of Moses. That's cool. Yeah. And <laughs> ever since I heard that from like multiple different um, popular philosophers, it kind of like changed my understanding of religion in general, which I was never really a big believer. You know, I grew up, I went to Hebrew school out of our mitzvah and everything, but I, I always continually questioned it just because... You know, it just seems like such a, like a outreach. Yeah. But it, it, you know, I really, I really like views like that, that put it into a more understandable because, you know, you know, it's not true that God gave him this 10 command, this tablet with 10 commandments on it. But like, you know, there's still, I guess enough like history and recording to indicate that something along the lines kind of like that happened and so you kind of have to find some way to rationalize it. And so it's really cool that, you know, there's, I, I don't know if like information for them, but really just like these ideas that, all right, sure, he had the Ten Commandments, but it was because he realized that they would just, they're people and they wouldn't believe him otherwise unless he told them God gave it to him, mm -hmm. which makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah, it's this <laughs> supernatural experience yeah. and that there was chaos. Yeah, I just imagine like uh, this, uh, just Moses being like, what, you guys followed me through the desert for 40 years and you don't believe me that these are good rules? Fine, God gave them to me. Yeah. Hey, are you happy? <laughs> and they're just like, oh. Oy vey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, felt, I think philosophy, um, even though there is there is no like specific jobs outside of academia, it those ideals and those like far-reaching um, thoughts is what created things like artificial intelligence and all these like oh, yeah. very specific and specialized disciplines oh, because yeah. it's the ability to think beyond what you see. Yeah, I mean, literally the a PhD stands for a doctorate of philosophy. And so- I it, didn't know that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's literally like you're studying the philosophy behind your field while studying the field. And so it's, um, it, yeah, philosophy is very valuable. And on the topic of like, you know, the idea of wanting to study something, but knowing that there aren't going to be academic or many jobs beyond academia, it makes sense. I think one thing that people should take away is that in this day and age when college degrees are so like widespread that when you study something, I mean, like think of how many degrees are people get in undergrad that aren't, that they don't really use in their job, but it was just a degree to have a degree. And so I think at a certain point, it becomes more valuable just for someone to study something that they actually want to study because it's going to promote them to do more during their education, like do more clubs or stuff or do more activities, do more research in that field. And that's going to look better when you go into a job market, even if it's still not related to that field, just showing that you do all this stuff about something that you're passionate about looks so much better than, yeah, I got a degree. I did it. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I think I think philosophy is one of those things where people necessarily shouldn't be um, dissuaded by the lack of philosophy-oriented jobs. They should study it because they want to study it and understand that maybe, much like other majors, it might not be something they end up doing in the long run unless they become a professor or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of how I was with kinesiology. I realized by my junior year that I wasn't going to pursue a degree in it. But it, I always say that I studied kinesiology so I could study myself. Yeah, I mean, you were, yeah, you were. <laughs> it's something you could use every day. Yeah, you're always killer in the gym. So <laughs> uh, you obviously use that in your everyday life already. Mm -hmm. It's, it's yeah, you can apply it to many different 
um, facets of life. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's just in general, good to know things about the body and how it works to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fun. Well, it's been an hour 45. All right. I love, I love it. I got, so I'll end this. I think we covered pretty much everything. I mean, I could, I could sit here and debate philosophy and everything for, <laughs> yeah. day, for time, but I'd be happy to come back on sometime. A hundred percent. You will. Um, also I still have to build credibility with my audience. So I can't be like Joe Rogan sit here for three and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, right. They're going to fucking, yeah, they're, they're going to be like, who the hell does this guy think he is? Yeah. They're going <laughs> to fucking turn it off. So I kind of have to set like a, uh, like a non-deterministic uh, limit on everything. That's fair. But um, I do have two questions always okay. before I go. Cool. Um, the first question is, all right, let me see how I'm going to apply this to you. The year is 2030. Um, where where do you see, I guess, yourself? And, or I'd say you Let's and the adva see. advancement of um, your discipline. All right. In 10 years, I... I see brain computer interfacing being so much more widespread that it's going to be something that we almost can't even live without at that point. I think uh, a lot of the research right now is so promising that even just something as simple as, um, you know, like uh, there's a device right now called the Muse. It's $250. It's guided meditation. Just even like a little bit more research that makes like guiding the meditation, how you're breathing and stuff that much better is going to be so valuable to us because we're finding out now that a lot of a lot of research is showing us that intellectual and mental disabilities are stemming from things like um, improper circulation to the brain and so if we could use things like you know what i use is eeg but there's also another type called fnirs which measures the blood flow in the brain and as a result it can help you you know adjust your breathing to help improve circulation and all these things are going to work to improve our mental health like dramatically and so you have that aspect of it. You also have the aspect of it of, you know, controlling stuff and, you know, brain controlled stuff. Who doesn't want that? And so I think that uh, this is really where the cutting edge of stuff is headed in the future in terms of like um, at least human based technology. And I think in 10 years, we're going to see it's going to be everywhere. I like that. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> we're ready as uh, I think it was Elon Musk says we're ready part cyborg because we're so attached to our phones. Oh, yeah. And it's even by law um, an extension of our mind. Yeah. I mean, just like, you know, on Neurosity's notion, who doesn't want some? I know I would love something that tells me when I'm focused and when I'm not while I'm working and helps me get back into that. Because being someone with ADHD, my biggest issue is figuring out how to keep my focus going. <laughs> And so a device that helps me do that, sold, 100%. Yeah, I think all the employers would love that as well. Oh, yeah. Productivity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Out, out the roof. Yeah. Um, and the last question um, is, what does Las Vegas mean to you? Um, I Las Vegas has been my home for 20 years now. Wow. And uh, it's, it's so diverse. People, it has this image of, you know, just being the place that, like America's playground, so to speak, but there's so much more to that. I mean, we have a tier one research institution at UNLV. We have, um, we're now a hockey city somehow. With <laughs> desert. It's, it's awesome. Uh, there's so much going on in this city beyond the strip that it's, it's amazing to me that people can't really, that people don't see that. And I think that's, what's really great about your um, podcast is that, I've always talked, even people in Las Vegas don't see Las Vegas for how beautiful it is. And uh, I, so many people in high school would talk about how, you know, they don't want to, you know, they would call UNLV, you never leave Vegas because they were so desirable, desiring to get out of Vegas because they couldn't see it for what it really offers. And uh, I think that's why your podcast is awesome because it's showing, you know, every aspect of, um, of Las Vegas it has to offer. Like you had a uh, jazz on, which so many people are like, have no idea about the sex worker industry altogether, let alone that we're becoming a hub for sex workers rights, specifically thanks to people like jazz. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think you're really doing the city a service. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I hope uh, that this will become a large platform, which we have been getting enough uh, followers for a good start. And um, it just takes everyone to buy into it and become a basically discovery platform. Oh yeah. So I appreciate you for that. Of course. Thank you for having me. Of course. And, um, for the listeners, um, it is in the show notes, but where can they follow you or get involved in any of your projects? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at NeuroClean. Um, on Instagram, I think my handle is the same thing on there. And um, yeah, you can shoot me an email at jaden.treadup at gmail.com. You'll be able to see the spelling in the title of the video. And if you have any questions or whatever, feel free to email me and you want to get involved, you just want to know more, 
whatever, hit me up. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. Fuck yeah. This was, uh, I love the um, intellectual levels that we hit on this. Uh, it made me excited. I was excited for this for a long time and we went a good distance. So thank you for coming on. Of course. Uh, thank you guys for listening and we'll catch you next episode.